gentlemen welcome to the study of antiquity and the middle ages as always i am your host nick barksdale and today we are joined not just by one but two very special and awesome guests dr amy kaufman and dr paul sturdivant thank you both for coming on the show today thank you for having us yeah thanks for having us so let's talk involving the middle ages medieval europe let's talk gender identity and sexuality in many ways, we see an often typical portrayal of the Middle Ages as, you know, it's masculinity and heterosexuality, but I feel like it's more complicated to the, than that. And I would like you all to set the record straight on this. So let's talk, let's talk about sexuality for a bit. Let's talk about sexuality and gender identity too. Why not? Um, that we, so I want to be a little careful, first of all, um, because our understanding of sexuality as an intrinsic identity is not necessarily something that that ports nicely onto the Middle Ages. Um, that no one described themselves as heterosexual. The, the, the idea, the word hadn't been invented yet. Nobody described themselves as homosexual, pansexual, bi, any, anything. Um, that having been said, um, and this is not just for men, but also for women, that we have plenty of examples of people who were homosexual, who were bisexual, uh, who were homoromantic uh, and biromantic, uh, meaning that they had uh, romantic relationships with people of the same sex uh, and, and, and whether or not those were necessarily sexual. There's been a lot of research that has actually looked at the ways that uh, monks and nuns would relate to one another as having same-sex relationships, if whether or not we know what they were doing behind closed doors. Because in a lot of cases, we don't really know. But in some cases, we do. We actually do know, uh, for example, that one of the caliphs in Al-Andalus uh, had a harem of men. Uh, and that that was something that was, there was some tutting about it, but it was something that was accepted, not least because he was the freaking caliph. <laughs> so what he did was accepted. Um, and, and also we do know that in uh, the Middle Ages, gender expression was different. We tend to think of masculinity and femininity as being these things that are frozen in amber, as if our ideas of what make a man a man are the same throughout time. Let me tell you, the, our ideas of what make a man a man are different from the 1980s to what they are now. Uh, looking back to the Middle Ages, they are radically different. So you find episodes in, all over, say, chivalric literature, in which these knights, who are supposed to be these super butch warrior types, of them weeping over their fallen comrades, of them being captured, of them doing, de of them doing deeply unbutch things, uh, in the actual Middle Ages. Um, and moreover, we have an understanding now that uh, we have an, uh, an ever increasing understanding now due to the work of a number of great uh, scholars like Roland Betancourt and Gabriel Bachowski of the degree to which gender fluidity uh, and transgender um, impulses, if not necessarily identities existed in the Middle Ages. For example, uh, we have examples of uh, medieval saints, medieval saints, no less, in both the Eastern and the Western tradition, um, who, okay, so take this. So you have the story of someone who is born female, but enters a monastery uh, and as a man and lives their entire life as a monk, as a, as a man in the monastery. Even so much that 
the reason why they are a saint is because the, as the story goes, um, they were accused of, uh, of actually fathering a child. And instead of bringing dishonor to the child, they then accepted that that, the, that, that child was their own. Uh, and for that act of self-sacrifice, um, that that's why they were sainted. And they were only discovered to actually be biologically female after their death. So in spite of every opportunity to say, no, that child can't be mine for the obvious reasons, they then continue to live as a man all the way until their death. If that is not an expression of want of being born with a female body, but wanting to live a male life, I don't know what is. Dr. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, do you have anything to add to that? I do, yeah. So you also talk about antiquity on this show. Uh, and I think the very long stretch of time uh, and what we know about human sexuality from antiquity through the Middle Ages, really all the way up until Freud, uh, reiterates what, what Paul said, which is that Sexuality was not thought of as an identity until very recently. It was thought of as a series of acts. Uh, and depending on where you are in history uh, and what the rules are of your particular culture, certain acts were approved of and certain acts were disapproved of. So in times and places in medieval Europe, sodomy was a sin, but so was masturbation, right? You might, you might say the same amount of prayers uh, to get rid of both of those things. But what that, what that stretch of time also shows us is that human sexuality has been on a spectrum since the, I hate the expression since the dawn of time, but really uh, since the dawn of recorded history, right? Uh, Rome and Greece are great examples where you have tons of free expression of same-sex desire uh, between women, between men, sometimes uh, bisexuality, right? Uh, Sappho is famous for her poems to women, but she also wrote poems about men. Um, because because it was normal. It, it was normal to do that. And in periods where human sexuality is allowed to have a spectrum, then it does. Uh, and, and when it's oppressed, then it goes underground. But it's always there. Uh, and I think that's important to recognize. I'll also add a note uh, about there was very much of a difference in the Middle Ages, um, and also in antiquity, about how women, women's sexual norms, um, and gender norms and men's sexual norms and gender norms are treated. So for a man to be with a man, uh, sometimes it depended on what position you were in, <laughs> whether or not you were judged for that sec sex act. Viking culture is like that, Roman culture is like that. Um, relationships between women were not often taken that seriously because the culture was phallocentric, because they believed that sex only occurred when pregnancy was possible or when it penis was involved. Um, when a woman dressed as a man, there's, there's of course the famous story of Joan, Joan of Arc being burned for it, um, but the charges against her were very political and very much heresy. Uh, there were many theorists who thought in the Middle Ages that it was perfectly reasonable for a woman to want to dress as a man because why wouldn't you men are better? <laughs> <laughs> right? and, and men have better lives, um, but it was extremely taboo for a man to dress as a woman. Uh, and, and so these, these ideologies, these ideas about gender and sexuality, they shift. But what you find when you dig, again, is, is a pattern you can recognize, right, that you can recognize today. And that culture very often shapes people in different ways. And if you can locate that, you can find the long thread of human history. And even in spite of the fact that it was taboo for men to dress as or live as women, um, that doesn't mean that they didn't do it mm -hmm. um, because it's clearly an expression of a very deep seated need. Um, uh, we have examples that, that maybe the most famous example is uh, of Eleanor Reichner, um, who was uh, in London and who uh, only came to his, you know, the historical attention, such as uh, you will, because she appears in the court records. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think that there are a lot of gender non-conforming lives that you find, or, that, or rather that you don't find, because you only know about them when they are outed. And so if they are able to live their entire lives as they please, then they go 
unremarked by in the historical record. And so much in the same way that we were talking about uh, whether previously, whether or not anonymous was, uh, was a woman, um, you can wonder if there were any hate famous historical figures who may have been living a gender non-conforming life that we never knew about. But back to Eleanor, I mean, we know about Eleanor because Eleanor is talked about in the court records um, because Eleanor is arrested on prostitution charges. Uh, and there is this difficulty uh, in the court of actually knowing what gender is authentically Eleanor's, whether Eleanor is really John or Eleanor is really Eleanor. And they don't actually come to a conclusion about that. Sure, there's lots of scandalous things that are thrown around about what, you know, the, about who Eleanor has been sleeping with, including a priest, which is fun. Um, but uh, ultimately, we as modern viewers are left wondering which is the authentic. And we don't have Eleanor's say in the matter, really, so we'll never actually know. Yeah, and there's some evidence that uh, medieval people had what we would consider very modern ideas about gender and identity uh, when it comes to transgender identity. Uh, there's a book called Silence, um, where the hero is born as a woman, um, become, I don't want to say dresses in a, as a man because she becomes a man, um, because uh, the king passes a law that women can't inherit. So her parents turn her into a man. Uh, and she is, of course, the manly, manliest knight, and she defeats all the other knights and all the women fall in love with her. But in the middle of the poem, there's a huge debate between uh, silence and the personifications of nature and nurture. Uh, and they leave it very much like that court case Paul was discussing. They, they leave it sort of a stalemate about what silence is. But there's very much a sense that silence chooses what silence is and makes the determination and that becomes her gender. It's, it's not dressing as or performing as, it's, it's essential. Uh, and I think that's a very modern idea. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for joining us here today at the Study of Antiquity in the Middle Ages, where we have discussed a variety of very interesting and awesome topics that you need to know about and do your part as well. I'm bringing this to you. They have so graciously given us their time and expertise today. And now I want you to take this knowledge and give it to someone else, because that's the thing. We may be novice historians. They may be the pros but we can do our part in helping teach history and make history matter. And it matters even more today. Dr. Sturdivant, Dr. Kaufman, thank you all so much for coming on today. Thanks for having us. This was really fun. Yeah, thanks so much. Appreciate it. <laughs>